Oh, so many games that I want to play on the channel. I wish I had some sort of guidance to help me decide. Well, that's a start. Greetings fellow flat caps and welcome to the Spectrum. Today's episode marks a milestone as we are about to finish the 70s chapter in the book. Today's game is one that has made quite an impact on gaming in ways that some of you may not have thought about before. It's one that some of you definitely will have played and we are sticking to the theme of space, but in particular we're looking at physics in space. Some of you may know what I'm on about already, but today's title is Lunar Lander. Inspired by the 1969 moon landing, Lunar Lander will challenge players to pilot a spaceship as it falls to the planet's surface and earn points by landing on the safety zones, which will result in a higher score or death of the entire crew. Ah! Ah! Oh, the humanity! Anyway, so what made it so special? Well, let's find out. Now in the book, we are looking at the 1979 arcade Atari version, but you know how we do things here, so we're not going to be starting there. Instead, we're going to be starting in 1969. 20th of July, 1969, humanity reaches a new peak in its evolution. NASA sends Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins to the moon. At 4.17pm, Eagle, the shuttle that carried them to the moon, lands. Then, at 10.56pm, Neil Armstrong utters those famous words and history is made. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The world watches in amazement and pride as the human race successfully begins our journey into the stars. One individual keenly watching is 17 year old high school student Jim Storer. Inspired by the event, he pitches an idea to his computer programming teacher about recreating the event as a text-based game. Stora jumps onto a PDP-8, the descendant of the PDP-1, you remember that? To create the text-based game that is... Rocket. After a Christmas break, he uploads the game to his high school system library, unintentionally planting the seed to which would eventually grow into one of the most influential games of all time. But for right now, let's take a look at Rocket and see what made it so special. Unfortunately, I had no way to play the original, but a recreation is available to play on the interwebs. Maths? Well, that might not necessarily be a bad thing. Milo, what grade did I get in high school for maths? Eh, uh, what do you know? It's just numbers, how hard could it be? <coughs> yeah, this, this isn't my kind of game. Some of you watching may be able to find enjoyment in this if you are into your space science and mathematics. So far I've killed four crews trying to figure it out because I am not big brain. So best of luck to you if you want to try it yourself. But the essential premise is that you have to decide how much thrust you want to apply to the ship as it approaches the planet. Do it too fast, you die. Do it too slow, you run out of fuel and you die. So it's always about finding that right measurement. But again, am no big brain cannot do. Despite the difficulty for an average man like me, Stora's computer teacher was so impressed that he submitted Rocket to the Digital Equipment Corporation Newsletter, or DEC. The DEC added it to their library of available software programs, and the source code as well, meaning anybody could purchase it and work with it. More programmers of all skill levels took interest and began using it for their own creations. In 1973, the DEC releases their terminal for the PDP-10 and 11, the company looks for a way to showcase the capabilities, so they commission a visual version of Rocket to be made, which at the time was more commonly referred to as the Lunar Lander game. Enter former DEC engineer Jack Burness, who creates a product in just 10 days and names it Moon Lander. As much as I would have liked to, there was no way I was going to try this one on its original hardware, as it used a light pen to control the throttle. And I couldn't even find a recreation of it online. All I could find were these two photos of it being used, but no footage at all. But you can imagine how fancy this is for the 70s. It's like an oversized DS. The text version found its way onto other computers like the Altair 8800 and even a version for the HP 25 calculator of all things. 
The visual version was limited to anything that had a vector monitor, so the general public didn't really get a chance to try it. Until 1979, when Atari takes centre stage with their new vector screened arcade cabinet, debuting their version of the Moon Lander game, known as Lunar Lander. So here it is, the star of the show. Using the tech that would eventually lead to the creation of asteroids, Lunar Lander shows off its advanced physics in order to offer up a new gaming experience. Your task is to simply land the Lunar Lander on the surface of the moon. Well then. Okay, simply isn't exactly the correct term, but neither is difficult. One coin gives you 750 units of fuel for each one you insert. You then need to get a high score by safely landing the lander on the surface of the planet, with certain highlighted areas offering more point multipliers. Tricky is a better way to describe it, but really all depends on your own ability to judge physics and how confident you are in taking on the harder landing spots, as although it is early technology, it is very impressive in how accurate it is. After a few attempts, I got the hang of it and less astronauts died by my mistakes. The controls are simple enough. You can turn on a 180 degree line and you have a single button that activates your thrusters. It was popular in the arcades for a time, but at its core, Lunar Lander is essentially a tech demo that shows off its simulation of physics, a shifting camera angle and a scrolling screen over a big level which led to the game's name soon becoming its own genre of games. Don't get me wrong. For the 70s, this is some cutting edge stuff and I can see why it appealed to a lot of players. Pong and Breakout attempted similar mechanics but they were simple compared to landing a spacecraft with limited fuel. But there isn't much else to the game, and it's no wonder that Asteroids took over it in popularity. Like I say, it's not a bad game, it just loses its appeal pretty quick. There is a unique feeling of watching your craft approach the planet as gravity fights against your thrusters, hoping that you hit the thrusters just at the right time to land and reach those hard to reach spots. With a shiny new genre brought into the gaming market, it wasn't going to be long before developers started trying to adapt it to their own needs. But with it being such a new technology and very limited to people who have actually mastered it, was it a good idea to? Well. Attempts were certainly made for the next three years. Now of course, with video games being the business that they are, copycats and mimicries were bound to appear, and in November of the same year, Taito made their own version of it called Lunar Rescue. The difference between them is a colour display, and no physics. If you're going to do a rip off of a game, you, you know, at least want to try and intimidate the thing that makes it popular in the first place. A Lunar Lander game without physics is like Star Wars without lightsabers, porn without sex, co-op games without the co-op. 1981 saw Jupiter Lander, which was a watered down version of Lunar Lander, only it had one static map that changed slightly depending on the version you were playing. In 82, the unresponsive, jittery as all hell Rocket Lander is a carbon copy of Lunar Lander, only much worse. Although I will say I am impressed with the 8-bit rendition of the Blue Danube. You need more practice, oh yeah? Well at least I can spell it correctly! 1983, Mars Lander by Argos Specialist Publications did a little better by adding changing landscapes and adjustable gravity. The problem with the gravity is that you can make it unwinnable by setting it to zero and forever hover in space or fly off screen never to be seen again. At least I actually get some points for killing the crew this time. Apollo 11 was also released in the same year for the ZX Spectrum. More colours but slower than a slowpoke stuck in Gorilla Glue. Now all of these titles have blown through quickly because they are essentially the same game. And they all share one problem. The frame rate. It isn't smooth enough because they tried to convert a cutting edge game to lower tech. As a result, trying to get a decent judgement on how fast you're going is difficult. Not to mention that with it being a new mechanic, not every programmer is going to understand how it works and get it right, let alone close, unless they worked for Atari who popularised it for modern gaming. After three years, gaming studios stopped trying to replicate Lunar Lander. 
including Atari. Once asteroids have proven the bigger moneymaker, that's where they put all their attention, leaving Lunar Lander to peacefully pass away into history, knowing it had created a new genre for future developers to be inspired by. Until 1990, when of all people, Nintendo digs up the corpse of Lunar Lander and attempts to resurrect the series with a Game Boy title. No surprise, that didn't work out so well. But to their credit, at least they actually tried to expand on the formula. You start the game off by launching your rocket into space, then spend the rest of the game attempting to land on the surface in increasingly difficult terrains. But wait, there's more. Not much more, but there's still more. Once your ship has landed, you then have to leave it and have to find five minerals buried on the surface before heading back to the lander and scoring points. Does that sound fun? Well, it gets even better. You need to repeat that tediousness 32 times on 32 levels that look the exact same with the exact same enemies that couldn't give a single fuck about your existence, all the while having the most beautiful soundtrack in your ears. Move over John Williams, Star Wars just got a new composer. Now normally at this part in the video we'd be looking something like a remake, a remaster, uh, a spin-off, a sequel, or even just the latest entry. But truth be told, when it comes to Lunar Lander, there's literally nothing. The closest we got was a remake by Nintendo, and that was abysmal. Lunar Lander however has certainly helped inspire a lot of games. A quick Google of Flash games and mobile games will find a never-ending supply of copycats and inspired titles. So if that's the best we're going to get from Lunar Lander, is there anything else worth looking at? Well, there is one thing, but maybe not really. There is one title called Lander by Psygnosis in 1999. It was a PC title which was inspired in part by Lunar Lander, but I couldn't get it to work so I can't give any commentary on it other than it looks like a hard to control generic spaceship shooter. So Lunar Lander, what did I think of it? Well, I still stand by my statement of it being a tech demo, even if it did manage to make it into arcades. Is it enjoyable? Absolutely, but only in spurts. With no increasing difficulty, sense of progression, and a speed that may be too slow for some players, it gets repetitive quickly. But we must remember that its main achievement was to push developers to try new things that led to other physics and space-based games in the market, which led to the creation of the iconic asteroids. So while I recognise its achievements in advancing game concepts, I need to judge it as a game that I play. And I'm putting it under yes, but it's a low yes. And now we have come to the end of the video, which now means the 70s chapter is complete. I admit that it wasn't exactly the best way to finish a chapter. Unfortunately, this is going to happen sometimes during the series. We might look at a game which had a huge impact but was still a one-hit wonder and ever since then has not done anything spectacular. So I apologise if you found this one disappointing, but I still have 991 episodes to make up for it. Oh dear god. Now however is the time for you to have your say. Did you play Lunar Lander? Do you remember playing it in the 80s? Do you like it? Do you agree with me that it's pretty much just a tech demo? As always, your thoughts are welcome in the comments below. As you type them out, I thank you for watching and remember you're always welcome at the Spectrum. <laughs>